In this video, I'm gonna teach you my secret to making a lot of money when there's stock market turmoil. I've used this three-step process to make a 266% return in Mexico, a 53% return in Brazil, 120% in India. I've been fine-tuning it for over 15 years, so there are a lot of examples. To show you how it's done, I'm gonna take you through a recent example of how I made about a 40% return in four months by investing in a 3X leveraged regional bank ETF. This is not an exact science and it's not guaranteed to work every time, but it has worked for me almost every time and it's made me a lot of money over the years. So naturally, I'm excited to teach you how I do it. It always starts with some sort of market turmoil. In this case, the first domino that fell was Silvergate Bank on March 8th, 2023. But honestly, no one was really worried at that point. Everyone thought, well, Silvergate was tied up in the whole FTX cryptocurrency mess and that doesn't really apply to other banks. But then just two days later, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, and two days after that, Signature Bank collapsed. And that quickly changed the narrative to, oh my god, we're heading into another 2008-style banking crisis. SVB went down on a Friday. Signature Bank went down on Sunday. And by Monday, the ETF had fallen almost 60% in just three days. I had never even heard of DPST at that point. But identifying market turmoil like that is step one. That tells me there's an opportunity. Step two is figuring out if there's a way to invest in that opportunity and whether I actually want to do it. The number one thing I look for to determine if I'm going to be interested is how likely things are to get better over the next few years. The short term will always be really uncertain at times like these, but the long term is often a lot clearer. Take oil prices in 2020, for example. They went negative. Do you really think oil producers were just going to pay you to take their oil from them forever? Of course not. It's not usually that easy, but in the case of the regional banks, it was fairly easy to diagnose the problems with the ones that failed and determine if other banks had the same issues. I put videos out along the way where I did that, by the way. There were three keys in this case. Number one, the issues that plagued the regional banks that failed did not apply to most regional banks. Number two, the government showed their willingness to step in and save them, having learned a few lessons from good old 2008. And number three, the banks were being priced like they were all gonna go bankrupt. To sum it up in a single sentence, the banks were priced like they were all gonna go bankrupt, but I was highly confident they were not all gonna go bankrupt. There lies the opportunity. Okay, so step one, market turmoil. Step two, confidence that it's gonna get better in the long run and people's short-term fears are overblown. And step three is how to go about investing in the recovery. I do not like buying individual stocks in these scenarios, and here's why. There were other banks that had issues and no one really saw this coming. So who's to say it couldn't happen to another bank? Why risk losing all of your money if you pick the wrong one? With the regional bank ETF, all you had to be right about was that they weren't all gonna go bankrupt. An ETF gives you about the same upside potential as an individual stock, or maybe even more with a leverage ETF, and almost no chance of losing all your money. Higher odds of making money, higher odds of making more money, and lower odds of losing all your money. It's the smart way to go, in my opinion. So for me, the most direct way I can invest in the recovery other than buying individual stocks is the way I'll go. Usually that's ETFs. And if there's a leverage ETF, even better. But you see, the other part of how to invest is the size and timing of your trades. Yes, size matters. This is very important, especially if you're using leverage ETFs like moi. We're talking about very aggressive investments in times of great uncertainty. It's impossible to consistently call the bottom in times like this. So I always like to start small. I think about it this way. What is the maximum I'd be willing to invest in this? Or put differently, what is the maximum I'd be willing to lose on this if I'm wrong? Divide that by six, and that's your starting investment. Again, there's no magical science to this, but this is usually how I go about it. Now, you may be asking yourself, Kyle, why six? Because I wanna leave room to double my investment twice if it keeps going down a lot and my long-term thesis remains intact. Imagine you're willing to invest $6. If you start with $1, then it goes down 20%, you can invest another $2. If it goes down another 20%, you can invest $3. At that point, you've invested $6, the amount you were willing to lose. I do it this way because then, mathematically, I'll break even when the stock is still down 27% from my first purchase price. That's how it works in theory. But like Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. So let's go through a real life example of how I implemented this in practice. And I'll show you why these situations will inevitably involve tough judgments that are hard to get perfectly right. Here's the timeline of my thought process and my actions. On Friday, March 10th, Silicon Valley Bank went bust. Regional banks sold off and I started doing research. Saturday, March 11th, I put out a video on it saying that there was a risk of more bank failures 
but it was very different from 2008 and unlikely to turn into a full-blown banking crisis like a lot of people feared. Lo and behold, the next day, another bank failed. That Monday, March 13th, regional bank stocks were way down. Details started coming out about how the crisis could have been much worse if the Fed hadn't stepped in to save a bunch of banks that would have failed that weekend. So one went down, but it could have been more like 10. Over the course of that week, regional bank stocks were all over the place. I digested all the information and put out videos explaining what was happening and what I was thinking along the way. These were very uncertain times, but eventually I made it through step two and decided it was an opportunity I was interested in investing in. On Friday, March 17th, I decided to take a small starter position in DPST, the 3X regional bank's ETF. So now is probably a good time to mention how this strategy attempts to curb the harmful emotions that get in the way of good investment decisions. Greed and fear, fear and greed. Greed and fear, fear and greed. Greed and fear, fear and greed. It helps with fear because you know you'll never invest more money than you decided you were willing to lose. It helps with greed because it forces you to start small. Could you make more money if you bet the farm on it right away and your timing's right? Sure, but your timing won't always be right. I look at it this way. If my timing is great on my first purchase and it goes up 50% right away, but only on a small amount of money, that's a win. I made a risk investment and got the timing perfect. I'm happy. I don't let myself go down the, oh man, if only I had invested more road, because you know what? The timing was lucky. It won't be right every time. And if it's not right, you'll be really happy you didn't invest it all up front. As it turns out, in this case, my timing was not right. The fear continued to spread. Credit Suisse, a large European bank, ended up having to be bailed out by UBS. And then people started to worry about Deutsche Bank in Germany. No one worried about European banks again after that, but I'm telling you about it because there are all kinds of pieces of information that get thrown at you in times like this, and you never know what will be relevant in the end. You just have to consider it all. On April 3rd, I put out a video showing that we'd finally gotten some positive news, that regional bank deposits had shown signs of recovery. At this point, DPST was down about 10 to 15% from where I bought it. And a few people asked me if I was thinking about adding. I did think about it, but ultimately I decided not to because I didn't think banks were out of the woods yet. And a 10 to 15% drop in a 3X leverage ETF during times of turmoil is nothing. My general rule of thumb for these kinds of investments is that they have to be down at least 20% from my prior purchase for me to buy more. Also, I know I said this before, but I'll reiterate. The original investment thesis has to remain intact. And in this case, it was. I still fully believed an eventual recovery was likely and not all the regional banks were gonna fail. It was basically one good day away from me breaking even until it wasn't. On May 1st, First Republic Bank went down and all the regional banks sold off significantly. Then on May 2nd, I put out another video explaining why the largest bank collapse since 2008 was the opportunity I had been waiting for. All along, I knew it was a very real possibility that another bank would fail and DPST will go down more. That's why I started small. But still, First Republic shared many of the same issues as the other banks that had failed. So it did not change my opinion that most of them would survive. At this point, I was down around 30 to 40% from my initial purchase, which by the way, I had broadcasted all over the internet. So that was fun. But I told myself to stick to the process. Mostly. You know how I said the process involved doubling my investment each time? Well, I chickened out and invested the same amount the second time as the first time. I even explained in my video how the best time to buy often feels the worst, but I still felt like there was a lot more short-term downside potential. Like I said, these times are really uncertain. So over the next two days, I lost about another 25%. When did I say I usually buy more? When it goes down 20%. Did I buy more? Nope. I chickened out again. You really can't call the bottom very consistently. Once in a while you can, but I can't stress enough how dire the situation with the regional banks felt at that moment. There were tons of news reports about other banks being on the verge of collapse. The ETF had just fallen about 50% in two weeks after already being down a ton before that. So how do you know where the bottom is? The answer is you don't. Hindsight is always 2020. And looking back now, my May 2nd purchase date doesn't look so bad. It was a few days away from the bottom. Even my original March 17th purchase is in the green. And I sold pretty much at the top on July 26th. We don't know what the rest of this chart is going to look like as we move into the future, but when to sell is also always an uncertain decision and a challenge to avoid the temptations of greed. The selling was a pretty hard decision. Could there be a lot more upside? Absolutely. As interest rates come down, that should boost the value of the treasuries that were hurting so many of these banks when rates went up. But what caused me to sell 
is that banks make money by borrowing at low rates in the short term and lending at higher rates in the long term. Usually, those short-term borrowings mostly consist of your checking and savings account deposits that they pay you next to nothing on. Well, they lost a lot of those, and while the government stepped in to save them, the money they borrowed to replace those cheap deposits was at short-term market interest rates, more like 5%. And how much can they lend out long-term money for on a car loan or a mortgage? Not much more than 5%. So the regional banks survived, but their profitability had come down a lot. That got us to a point in late July where even though their stock prices hadn't come back nearly to where they were, their valuations had reached their pre-crisis highs. By valuations, I mean price to earnings or PE ratio. The price was down, but so were the earnings. That meant valuations had fully recovered to where they were before Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. But now we had greater known risk and a looming potential recession. No thanks, I'll take the win. I usually like to hold things for at least a year because I hate paying extra taxes on my gains. For most people, they're generally lower if you own an investment more than a year, in case you didn't know that. But in this case, it just no longer felt like it was an attractive investment, so I decided to sell. It's different every time. And like you saw, the process isn't an exact science and it involves constant, difficult judgments along the way. But the good news is that if you follow this process, you don't have to be perfect. I've had tons of success with this process on oil prices, Brazil, Mexico, India, US small caps, industrial stocks, and I've made videos about a lot of them. For most people, most of the time, I'm a much bigger advocate of staying diversified, thinking long-term, and not trying to time the market. But I do this myself, and it usually makes me a lot of money, so I wanted to share my wisdom with you so you can use this in the future if you're willing to take the risk. If you haven't seen it yet, take a look at my recent video on the Japanese yen. That's the latest example of this process in action.